Okay, here it is the fourth. Dear Lord, not the cross, facing my sins that I committed yesterday. Even no more than half of them, I don't know what they were. All I know is I wasn't thinking of you all day. I was watching movies, going for a ride at my school, that kind of stuff. Anyway, Lord, thank you for opening up Vegas partway. I got tomorrow, it's really going to be open tonight. You might take a ride to the casino. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me of my many sins from yesterday. Now we're going through the devotions. I'll give us something that will stick with us today to keep our eyes on you. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Thursday, June 4th, brick by brick. Therefore, do not lose heart. The inward man is being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Thomas Carlyle labored with intensity in the first volume of a three-part study of the French Revolution. He felt it could be his greatest work. He loaned the manuscript to his friend, John Stuart Mill, to read, and Mill read it by the fire. One morning, the maid, cleaning the room and seeing the scattered papers on the floor, threw them in the fire. When Carly learned his manuscript was burned to ash, he sank into abstemal depression. Sometime later, still desolate, he saw a brick mason through the window. The man was standing on his scaffold, singing and whistling to himself as he built the wall of a house one brick at a time. Watching him, Carly decided he would write his book again, one page at a time. His history as a revolution became famous, and he remembered as one of the Scotland's literary giants. Perhaps you lost something very valuable to you. Don't give up. Tomorrow still holds a bright promise, and the Lord blesses faithful, floating work. Let's take it step by step, day by day, and moment by moment. Look into Jesus till glory doth shine, moment by moment. O oh Lord, I am thine. Daniel Whiting. What does God look like? By Brian Kemper. Thursday, June 4th, 2020, Scripture Reading, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. The Son is the exact representation of God's being, Hebrews 1, 3. Have you ever been asked by a child, what does God look like? Or have you ever wondered about that yourself? Hebrews gives us the answer to this question. Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. What does God look like? He looks like Jesus because Jesus looks like God. To some of us, this might sound helpful because we do not know exactly what Jesus looks like. But this is about more than just a physical appearance. We know that Jesus became a human being so we can assume things about his physical nature, but this also means much more. John says in, and Jesus says in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Likewise, we're told in Colossians 1, 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God. Oh. In Jesus, we can see God. And this is how to do with, and this has to do with God's character. Jesus reveals the exact imprint of God's nature, as some Bible translations put it. In Jesus, we see the 
God is loving, merciful, caring, just, righteous, and more. In the actions and words of Jesus, we see God's character. Jesus revealed God's character the most clearly when he showed his love for us by dying on the cross to save us from our sin. In, in that one act, we see God's love, mercy, care, justice, and righteousness. If you want to know what God looks like, look to Jesus. In him, we see what God looks like in all his glory. Father God, as we look to Jesus, we can see you and experience your great love for us. Help us to show your love to others as your representatives. Amen. June 4th, by faith. By faith, Noah condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Since its founding in the 1770s, America was known as a Christian nation. Many pilgrims were Christians seeking religious freedom. Many founding fathers were Christian, and many fundamental documents express biblical principles. But beginning in the mid-20th century, America began to be known as a post-Christian nation as God was moved further towards the edge of public influence. It is harder to live as a Christian in a post-Christian nation than in a Christian one. Some would say so, but in truth, it doesn't matter where we live. The biblical requirements for faithfulness as the way to please God is the same. The need to remain faithful never changes. Noah proved it is possible to live in a corrupt culture and still please God. His holy fear, holy reference of God caused him to stand firm in faithfulness in spite of getting no support from the culture in which he lived. You may feel unsupported in your nation, your home, your workplace but you can remain faithful to the one who is always faithful to you. June 4th, Breaking Bread. Be continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and supremacy of heart, Acts 2.46. Thousands of people found Christ on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, and suddenly a huge family was born in Jerusalem. Perfect strangers became instant brothers and sisters, and former foes became friends. The population of Jerusalem suddenly had a community of people who claimed citizenship in another world, and new habits formed among them. One was going to church to worship Jesus, and another was breaking bread from house to house. These traditions have never expired. We need our larger family gatherings each Sunday as we assemble to worship. Christ on a weekly anniversary of his resurrection day. We also need time with family and friends who share our values, where we draw strength from each other. Time with other believers provide the encouragement we need to be faithful in our walk with the Lord. Do you have another believer with whom you talk and pray? Do you have a small group with whom you can fellowship and grow? These aren't optical disciplines. They are an essential part of the Christian experience. Luke chapter 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place 
while Cornelius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judah, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men to whom his favor rest. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. <clears throat> he was waiting for the coalition of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you are now dismissed, your servant in peace. And my eyes have seen his salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is to disdain to cause you failing and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, 
and his sword will pierce your soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Penel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then they went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. In love and memory of Dorothy E. Taylor, July 11th, 1926 to July 6th, 2014. God saw you getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. With tearful eyes, we watched you and saw you pass away. Although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, hard work and hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us He only takes the best. Psalms 39 I said I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not saying anything good, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere hand's breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. Psalms 38 My guilt has overwhelmed me, like a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and are loathsome because of my sinful folly. I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about mourning. My back is filled with searing pain. There is no health in my body. 
I am feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. I am like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Come quickly to help me, O Lord my Savior. Once again, <clears throat> humbly I come before you, thanking you for what you've done in the past, thanking you for what you're going to do today, and thank you for what you're going to do later today and tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got its own problems. I'll deal with those tomorrow. I'm worried about today. I don't even know why I said that. Because I should not worry at all, should I? Not when I'm in your presence. Lord, please forgive me for doubting you. I guess that's another sin. Doubt. Yes, it is. Let me think of it. It is. I'm sorry for that. Lord, my full request for my family, please pour out your wisdom on them so they don't take their eyes off you and continually pour it on them all day long. As for my friends I went to school with, Please pour out your wisdom on them all day long and their extended family also all day long so that they won't take their eyes off you. As for those on my Facebook page that I call my friends and their extended family, Lord, all day long, just pour out your wisdom on them. And my fourth, I sin even when I talk to you. When I talk to you, I sin. Just like I did earlier in this prayer I'm praying to you now. I'm the worst of the worst. If sin was capitalized, I'd be totally caps. Please forgive me. Lord, it's hard. But I want to come home. I'm tired of being of the world. And I sure don't want to be back in the world, no. I don't want that either. But I don't want to be of the world either. I don't want to be with you. And Mom and Chuck and Hazel. And everybody else that's already in heaven. Lord, that's my only prayer. <laughs> but you have other things you want me to do. Just show me. That's all you have to do, Lord. Show me. Thank you again. Okay. And I love you, Lord. Amen. Okay.